Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar. Uh, the topic of discussion is going to be around how government contractors can improve profitability with modern project planning. We'll go through a brief introduction of the panelists that we have on the call today. But before we begin, I want to start off with covering the agenda. There's a lot of topics that we have to go through today, and we would love to share uh, our opinions on the market and some of the challenges that we see firms facing, as well as ask a few poll questions just to get to know the audience a little bit more, and that way we can steer the conversations directly to you. The first topic of discussion today is going to be around avoiding common contracting, contracting challenges. But we've worked with several government contractors in and we have discovered that they all share very similar challenges within their organization. And today we're going to talk about how to avoid some of those top challenges. Next, we're going to talk about staying balanced in, when facing uncertainty. Today, all businesses face uncertainty, and those challenges start to increase as the uncertainty in the world or the economy starts to increase as well. So we'll talk about how do we stay balanced in that type of ecosystem. Next, we're going to talk about leveraging data to make data-driven decisions. Ultimately, data is the new gold, as most people have experienced, especially with this AI boom. And the idea here is to actually consolidate all of your information into one place, so that way you have the trust in your data, as well as the ability to make data-driven decisions or impactful decisions for the organization. Second to last, we're going to talk about optimizing resources in the government contracting space being able to leverage data, which is going to be the key concept today and the key focus today, and how you can use that data to optimize your resourcing across all the different government projects that you may be working on. And then last but not least, we're going to share some of the expertise from Nasser, who has joined me today, and we'll do a brief introduction after this slide, talking about how do we cut through the red tape. Some of the challenges that we've seen in the government contracting space ultimately provide that red tape, and we're going to talk about different ways to get around that and streamline your operations and, again, get back to those data-driven decisions. So I am thrilled to be welcomed with Nasser on the call, who is a leading expert in the government contracting space, has decades of experience that he'll be able to share with a lot of you. I definitely encourage everyone to ask their questions, because today is going to be more of ask the expert type of session with some uh, examples of what we've done for other clients. Uh, so first I'll introduce myself and then I'll hand it over to Nasser to give a brief introduction of himself and then we'll go ahead and get started. So my name is Mike Zach. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Actaris. Actaris is a budgeting, planning, and forecasting platform that's built around the Microsoft ecosystem, specifically Excel and Power BI. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Nasser, who's going to be the, who most of you are going to want to uh, ask questions with, because he's the industry expert. So Nasser, please. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Nasser Rizvi. I'm a CPA and chartered accountant. I've been working in the accounting space basically since I graduated university, but then I gravitated towards the challenges of government contracting and accounting, working mostly in the analytical reporting and uh, systems implementation space. So I've seen a lot in this particular space, all the way from how to deal with the equations to kind of building the, uh, the mechanisms that actually drive um, how to get the, uh, the numbers going. So um, ask me what, if, whatever uh, I can answer, I'll try my best. What I wanted to do first is kind of go through a series of questions. So Nasser, I'm going to lean on your expertise now to sure. answer just a variety of questions as it relates to avoiding common contracting challenges. So let's start off with some of the most common challenges that you've seen in the government contracting space and ultimately how people have solved some of those challenges. Um, from an FP&A uh, perspective, which, we wanna, which we're talking about today, I think one of the biggest challenges is always going to be uh, indirect rate application. So you have a set of forecasts and budgets for projects, and you have indirects that you don't necessarily know how they are going to be attributed to each of the projects. And so how do you get those indirects attributable? Um, you can't simply you know, try to break down your indirect costs, like let's say um, your medical benefits, right? And try to go all the way down to project level. It's got to be a calculation. So, what often happens is that we start using rates that are not necessarily applicable in the future. So what we do is we say, oh, let's just use last year's rates, right? We use last year's rates to, to kind of project out what the indirects are going to be. And oftentimes those last year rates are not going to be 
accurate. And so you're going to have to do a lot of like uh, a balancing act sometime in the future to try to, you know, see what you, what, where the right number is, right, of how to properly allocate um, this indirect cost. So that's definitely one big challenge. The other one is just apps, just getting numbers for at the project level, right? So oftentimes just setting up the budget. I mean, let's just get more simple than that. It's just like, how are we going to be able to assimilate all the budgets for all the different projects if we're going down to project level, which you should have as a government contract, that's what it's all about. And how do we how do we combine all of them? So we have GL budget and we have project budgets, and it's, it becomes a it becomes a challenge to try to assimilate all this information and have one big you know kind of budget that everybody can rely upon. And then also, um, you know, to produce valid uh, information budgets versus actual, right? So if you want to see PSR, do you want to see it going forward? Okay, what is our what will our PSR look like? And how are we tracking against it given our actuals coming? So these are all uh, challenges and a lot of people deal with it in different ways, but oftentimes there's definitely some inefficiencies and to be quite, quite honest, there's a lot of inaccuracies in the process that's managed. Yeah, and I've, I've noticed that too with a few of the clients that we've been able to implement together is, is you know, really starting with the, the first pain point, which is data aggregation, getting all this information out of cost points or Dell Tech or some sort of accounting system that they're already leveraging. A, a lot of that data sits inside of that, but it, we need to unlock and be able to provide visibility into that information and allow organizations to slice and dice in different ways. Because as we all know, we live in an agile type of world in an uncertain one. So we need to be able to slice and dice and provide that what if simulation. But it all starts with the foundation and getting the information out quickly, building data models around that information so it's scalable across various departments. And it gets out of this whole idea of what we call Excel hell. A lot of organizations that we start working with, all of this information is in Excel today. And it's extremely hard to share that and collaborate with different team members. And what we're posing, proposing for a lot of organizations is to sit down with them and understand what is their current process. And what are those challenges that you just outlined uh, perfectly, Nasser? And how can we kind of start to mitigate some of those challenges by starting with building of that foundation? The fa that's, that's, I think, the most important thing is the foundation. Um, it's one thing to be able to do your forecast budgets and reporting and stuff, but how fast are you doing it? How efficiently are you doing it? I wrote a, a white paper on the subject quite a while ago, and, it, uh, and it, it, when I was doing the research for it and just thinking about it and looking at you know, my past projects, it always starts with a data model. Data model basically, as the analogy goes, and I think I've shared this with you, Mike, once or twice, is that you know, cost point or whatever ERP system you have, the data that resides in it, the way it's tailored is to be a warehouse, which means to, to basically be the least expensive data uh, warehouse possible, i.e., cost less space. You want, don't take up memory, don't duplicate data, etc. And so when data model is designed. ERP systems, they wanted, that's their goal. It's like, how are we going to uh, design this to take up the least amount of space and to have the least amount of um, insert statements, if you will, to be able to go against this uh, this data, right? Well, when you walk into a warehouse as a shopper, right, you don't want to have to get your hard hat on and a forklift and try to find this data. And this warehouse is only built to, to maximize the efficiency of storage. It becomes nearly impossible, especially for an accountant who doesn't know what the tables are, where the stuff is, et cetera. So, What's always needed, if you want, if you really want to get your data efficiently, it's like going to the shopping center where the cereal is all in the same spot and the milk's there and then the juices are all the, you know, the, the basic food groups are all on the outside aisles. And it's, you know where to find stuff very easily, right? And so that's what a, a, a data mark does. It takes all this information from the back and it presents it in a way for users to be able to use it very efficiently and to, uh, whether it's, Power BI you're using in the front end or Excel, it, it doesn't really matter. But the thing is, that it's an understandable way that we get the data. And we've done that for our customers to be able to take cost point data, which and there's 2,000 tables back there, but we, we you know, skinnied it up and assimilated it in a way that's easy to get to and then you can do your report. That's where it really starts. Yeah. And from there, you know, we've obviously worked on getting data back into that same data model. Right from right back that we're going to be presenting shortly, but 
it's one thing to take it out. Now we got to, the forecast and budgeting is putting data back in and we make that easy as well. So really it starts with that heart, which is let's get the actual numbers so that we know a, a starting point from our fp &A, and we can actually present it and, and kind of do the gymnastics around presenting it. And then the next step is, okay, how do we get the budgets to compare and to bump up against the actuals that we've already mined from our accounting system? That's kind of where we are. Yeah, that's a perfect yeah. analogy. And it, and the, really, the like you said, the first thing to get a quick win internally is to organize your data and report off of that data. And 100%. then getting into the ability to do the what if simulation, which is that right back capability and creating that two way street and communication across the organization. It's basically like going from horse and buggy in your accounting department organization into a vehicle. Like if you want to make the step up, you really have to be able to get that data in a way that your users, like all the users can be playing around with it. Or else you're going to be like, you know, you have a wheelbarrow, you're going to have horses and carriages. And it's just going to be like that. You can put, you can put a lot of headcount into things that otherwise you could do in an automated fashion and more efficient. That's just simple. It's, it is what it is. I'm yeah. not even trying to sell anything. <laughs> just, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true, which is, which is actually a great segue into the next question uh, to, for Ask the Expert is around what are some of the, the costly mistakes that you typically see with an organization? Top three, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, co like costly mistakes, like what do businesses do that, that cost them a lot of time or money in some cases? Right. What do you typically see with an organization? Time and money, that's, that's great. So we have a lot of manual process. People don't understand that there's technology that has arrived that can make and replace a lot of the um, let's say manual things that are repetitive, right? That they can simply, uh, you know, like I said before, they can get from the horse and buggy into uh, a car, right? It's a very simple step, but they just have to make that investment and be able to learn how to drive a little bit, too, right? And just have an open mind about things. So what often happens is that we, when there's an issue with reporting or analysis or you know, an fb &A process, we throw a headcount, right? And the headcount just keeps on building up and it's just like now the, you have headcount doing the same repetitive task over and over again, and it doesn't really breed any efficiency. That's one. Um, I think the next one um, is just common mistakes like where we're using, like as you mentioned uh, earlier, is that we're satisfied with um, a kind of a, a fuzzy um, process, i.e., I'll just use last year's rates to, to project future rates. That's okay. Well, and so if you don't have tight budgets and you don't really, you're kind of flying blind. You know, and so that's another mistake is that people underestimate the value of the, of the forecasting and budgeting process. And I'll give you an example of working with a client that uh, they got taken over by a, a private equity firm. And the private equity firm, as you guys probably all know, that they're, they're very, like, you know, very particular about budgets. And, and that's, that's how they make money. They make whole people responsible to the budgeting process and, you know, make sure that everybody's accountable. Like that company, when they took it really seriously, the budgeting process, we were there to help them out in that process. I mean, they turned around that company really fast, you know? And so it's, it's oftentimes it's underestimated how, how valuable that process is. It's like having, I mean, you guys, y'all have home budgets. A lot of people fly and, and conduct their life without the budget. And a lot of people, you know, have budgets and you can kind of tell the difference pretty quickly, which ones are using budgets and which ones are not. So um, that's another one. And I think lastly, I mean, I think we spend, way too much time on um the the unicorn stuff you know we want the buzzwords that are coming in lately like ai we want uh, predictive analysis no one really knows what that means if you ask right but when you go into uh, organizations they're talking about things that are um not even foundational they wouldn't even know have the foundations to begin to do those type of things and it's a so it's it's a bit frustrating when you know when you're having those discussions it's like predictive analysis for what what do you want the uh ai for what what do you want to do we can barely get out financial statements right to look at or psr project status reports we don't even have a a good way to calculate our forward rates to be able to um bid on contracts in the going forward right is it is, is my fringe rate going to be 41 percent it's going to be 45 percent well let's just use last year's it's good enough and then we kind of eyeball it and then we're you know behind the eight ball when it comes time to you know hold up the contract so those are a couple of things it's just like uh, maybe taking things a little bit too lightly in some areas maybe 
overshooting this uh, in, in other areas and try to find that balance of what is important to the organization and what are the right tools uh, to be able to apply for the right problem. Right. Yeah, and you make you make a valid point. It's, you know, we we hear this a lot with with all types of customers, and it's getting to the point where the executive team is pushing down this whole concept of AI because it goes back to your point, right? Buzzwords that they're hearing this in the market, and it truly is going to revolutionize the repetitive tasks that people go through. But it only will do that if you have the foundation there and you know your data and, and you know your business and you know how it operates because those things and those inputs are going to be valuable to make AI a lot smarter and provide that human element to the machine component and both of those will kind of come into play. So it's, it's the pressure that a lot of these executives are putting on organizations to be AI forward thinking, but they have legacy platforms that they're still continuing to use and they, have, they don't have a budget to actually upgrade those. So this actually leads into the next um, next topic that we'll go into, which is around staying balanced when faced with uncertainty. Like, how, how do you stay balanced when you face uncertainty? And it's, it's, and it's, a, it's a hard challenge. It really is. And we, we see this with all types of organizations, not even just with government contractors. It's the fact that all these things are moving fast. And with AI and a lot of the push forward, that things are moving a lot faster and people are becoming more productive and are expected to be more productive as well. But when you built on the legacy foundation, it's hard to scale. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we hear constantly is, yes, we can, we can provide this type of infrastructure, but can we provide it enough to scale and be, be where we want it to be? So one of the questions that we typically get all the time in the government contract space is how do you improve the accuracy of your financial planning and forecasting to avoid over budgeting or under budgeting? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So it all starts with a, a, a ground up approach, right? So what I mean, here's what I mean by that. A lot of people will just take, you know, uh, swag guesses, Sometimes and they were like, you know, they know their business enough, and they think they do, and they and they and they kind of like uh, paint a, a paintbrush, and they say, okay, what are what are we going to do with this project? What's you know, and then they kind of come up with a budget, and it's kind of almost out of their institutional knowledge that they have. And sometimes that's great and it works, right? But it works much better, especially as the organization gets long, uh, larger, is when you have a process in place. And what I mean by the process is like this. You start from the ground up and you say, okay, the, the largest expense that we have for this project is direct labor. Let's get down to the resource level and we are going to do a budget, right? For the project by month. Then you say, okay, what, what's going to go on top of that? And then we have other direct costs, okay? We can identify the project for these costs. Let's go line by line of the other direct costs and budget it for this project by month for as far as we need, okay? And then the, the difficult part starts happening. When you start getting the indirect costs, it's like okay, great, but I have to also burden all of these costs with indirect, okay? And that's where things get a little bit more complicated, okay? And that's where you need a system that's very, very difficult to replicate manually. The uh, the mathematics that has to happen in order for you to allocate in, indirect costs all the way down to the project level and bake it into your into your forecast. That's really where a lot of failure happens, to be quite honest. With you. So what, and you and I have worked on is being able to take your forecast and indirect costs and be able to allocate them down to the project on the same basis as what's being done currently. So we can take you know, the pool and base structure that's already in place and say, listen, we're not gonna, we're not inventing new pools, we're not inventing new bases, et cetera. Let's just keep the structure the way it is. But the numerator and denominator that needs to be factored into our calculation that goes into the future and to our forecasts, they change. So can you apply the same? type of rate structure to these numbers? Yeah, we can. And what does that mean? That means you're gonna have a very accurate projection. You have very accurate uh, project status reports that are going forward based, right? There's no surprises now. No one can say, hey, listen, I got stuck with a 45% a fringe rate when I thought it was 40. Of course, I'm gonna be over budget, right? And now you got a back and forth in a meeting about what the really rates are and you got, it's happened to me. Now you got a bunch of back office people just scrambling, trying to figure out how do we make these two people arguing people, which, which one's right, who's right, and it just becomes a mess. So it it starts with making sure that you have your uh, your T's crossed and your I's dotted. 
right? What's in your control is, can you get these numbers accurately projected onto a piece of paper in front of a project manager or program lead and make sure that he is satisfied that these numbers are the numbers that are gonna be reported. There's no disconnect between financial statements and the collection of all your project status reports. The, the, when you add them all up, they equal the financial statements. There's no wide you know, disconnect. It's like, wait a second, you know, why is that when I add up project A and project B results and look at the GL and the accounting, it doesn't add up, right? So now you have a, you had a problem, right? You got, you got financial statements being presented as the, uh, how the company's doing, and then you have projects being presented as how the projects are doing, and it, the three different stories, right? So that's that's definitely a problem. You got to be in sync, and I think that segues into if you have a common data model where all the information is being disseminated, and you're putting back information into that model based on your project budgets, and then the last and more scary step is that you're being able to allocate indirect costs that you are forecasted down to those projects to see a future forward project status report, you've killed two birds with one stone. Number one, you got forward rates that you can actually use when you're bidding on new contracts that are accurate based on the best projections that you have. And secondly, right, you have something to sail the ship by an accurate navigation to make sure that your projects are going to be um, profitable. Otherwise, I've seen a lot of situations where the projects haven't been profitable because they used the wrong rates. They just underrated it. Now they got to go back and scramble with contracting and try to get more money somehow, et cetera, et cetera. So best to do it well in the first place, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and one key term that I'll, I'll point out in, in your message there, which is trust, right? Trusting the data and making sure that when you're looking at that piece of paper or that system or that screen, that you're actually able to make the decision and trust that the information that you're seeing is accurate. But that's like the worst in any case. It doesn't even have to be FP&A related. If you don't trust the data, then you need, and the fear that you have that you're going to look incompetent is, is terrible. And you want to be able to have that within a system, within a process. And as, as you mentioned, having that data model allows you to have a little bit more, a lot more trust in where the data is coming from, so it's connected directly to your source system. And ultimately the reporting is designed and tailored specifically to what you look at on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the, you got the human element on top of that where if you do see something that's inaccurate, you'll be able to eyeball that and know that this is completely off and be able to investigate it with that bottoms up approach because you have that granularity that you can always tap into. Agreed, I'll give you an anecdote real quick. Uh, if you guys will. So, you know, yeah. I used to set up uh, dashboards and, you know, analytical things for uh, using various products for um, back in the day, right, is for, for government contracts. So at the end of the project, we'd always go in and the, the last quarter mile was, okay, let's show these guys, you know, the analytics behind what it is, you know, that we implemented the accounting system now, and then we got some reports coming out of the accounting system. Now let's, let's show them some analytics, some dashboards and stuff. Right. And it was mostly for like just to train them on how, like, you know, the system works. You click here, you click that, you can do this, that, right? But what would always inevitably happen, I think it was 100%. Okay. 100% of the time, we'd have the executives in the room and we would be basically doing an analytical session. Oh, wait, 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 back up, back up. Let me see what Mike's utilization is. Okay. Go back to, you know, NASA. Let me see what he was doing. And, and oh, oh, what's the rate? I'm, it was like, you could tell they had no clue, right? What and any trust in their previous numbers. You could tell they were so fascinated that they, we could actually get this now. So it's like even less complex. So maybe we're trying to like, you know, bite off more, but even at that, just people realizing what is actually in their system and, and it's and surfacing it so that you can actually have some sort of reliance and even visibility into it, right? Is a big thing. I didn't realize. I thought this was just like, you, know, you don't know your own race. You don't know what the utilization is for Mike. No, but a lot of times it was, that was already different, right? So um, we offer obviously that and a lot more, right? It's just like, we're not only offering the visibility, but there's some heavy duty stuff that we can do to offer way more in terms of your data management than just being able to get it visible. But don't discount the fact that a, a lot of times people even struggle with it being visible. 
right? And POS1 is one of those systems. Not easy to get the information that you want out of POS1. I know there's other tools out there that are kind of native for POS1 users like Cosmos, et cetera. But again, I'm not trying to say anything about Cosmos, but every time I've worked with a government contractor that's, uh, you know, work with Cosmos, they're trying to get rid of it as fast as possible. You know, can you please help me? Please help me, man. I mean, this is, yeah, this always happens, right? So that, that we offer an alternative to as well. You know, we have some slick, more modernized kind of uh, reporting and analysis that we can do with, uh, with your data model. And then obviously the front ends that we can present with the most commonly used, uh, you know, applications out there right now, Power BI and stuff, and sells and everything. Yeah, and, and I've come across that too. It's like one legacy system on top of another legacy system compound. And there was a, an article I was reading actually in the Wall Street Journal the other day that talked about technical debt, like technology debt. And a lot of these legacy systems, they're, they're just, they have a huge burden that they have to get out of. I think it was like one or $2.5 trillion that is spent on technical debt. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. So it's Don't using it. these modern tools that are flexible. Yeah. I don't doubt that at all. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting world we live in, that's for sure. Even large organizations, Mike, we've seen a lot of people just, you know, resort to the uh, common denominator, which is just the way I kind of learned how to do it. And, you know, and sometimes I'm not, it, it is what it is. I mean, a lot of people have that comfort level, but I think at this point, with, with data becoming so out there and so prevalent and so massive, uh, and in order to stay competitive, competitive you kind of have to manage it, right? You can't take the wheelbarrow anymore when the guy beside you is using a bulldozer. You're going to be out of business fast. It's just the way of nature to be. So, uh, as the leaders in the finance uh, organizations have to really, you know, spearhead this and say, listen. And we had a really good example of it in our, in our you know, you know, often we had a really good example of it where they realized very quickly that this is, you know, doing it the old way is not going to fly. There were massive amounts of data. We have a billion dollar organization. A government contractor and we have a lot of projects and a lot of people with a lot of you know at stake in these projects and so just doing it the old way is just not going to fly anymore right and so and you don't have to be a billion dollar organization but certainly it helps to get something in place and and, and i know near the end of it like our solution is it's, it could be a billion dollar organization or it could be a million dollar organization it's equally valid for both right it's just your level of your tolerance for doing it the old way at some point, you got to decide, you know, you want to just throw more and more headcount on it and still get the inaccurate information quick, more quickly, or do you want to do it in a, in a different way, right? And, and get accurate information quick. At some point, you got to go with the bulldozer. Just that, yep. it's just kind of, yeah, at some point. And, and, and the key word there, agility, right? You want to be agile. You want to be able to change. And in a lot of the bigger organizations, it's harder for them to do that. So being a smaller organization and being able to affect change across the, the company is sometimes a lot easier to do. Oh. And you're, you're positioned in a better spot in that case, too, to go against the bigger competition. Agreed. Yeah. It's all about your leadership. You know, it's like, can they drive change and how nimble are you? Some large companies become very stale and some large companies choose to remain nimble. And same thing with uh, smaller companies. Some of them are, they remain stale and some of them are very nimble. It's obviously um, more easy to be nimble if they're smaller, but you know, I've seen both. Right? You've seen small companies that were less nimble than even large companies. It's just a mindset. And I think it's in this yeah. accounting and finance space, it really starts here. Can you wrangle your data? Do you have a, a plan? Do you have, do you, can you get the bulldozer and get away from the wheelbarrow and shovel, right? And that's where it starts. And it's not that expensive. This, this whole concept of getting this bulldozer is not that much of a big deal as it used to be, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, right? Now you got some slick tools and you got some people that know how to implement them quickly and the results are very quick, right? It's a quick strike. So I just, I know in the past people have been afraid, especially accountants. They don't, they don't like data, they're afraid of data. No, 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 I don't want to go into there and the back end tables. Like, you know, trust me, you're not going to change anything. You got to read access, but it doesn't matter. They're just afraid of the back end and it's like, no, that's a data guy, you know? So once that uh, hurdle is crossed, I think for finance and accounting folks, I think it becomes a self-service type of um, uh, arena. 
and there's less now reliance on other folks that are not necessarily trained in accounting and finance to be able to you know have that reliance anymore. You can kind of start, you know, fighting your own fight because you have all the tools that, that, you, that you need, which is good. Yeah, I like yeah. That scenario. Yeah, okay. and it's it's funny you bring that up because you know again going back to the the very hot topic that's been over the last couple of years is, is AI. And AI is a mechanism for accountants to use natural language to get to the information quickly. However, if you want to trust that data, you want to also understand how it was designed and how it was built and where it's coming from. So when you do ask those natural questions in the, in, and it pulls up the data, you have that confidence. So it's kind of a, a double-edged sword. It's like, yes, you want to use AI and you want to be up to speed with the latest yes. technology and use this natural language, but you also have to understand the structure of things and how, we, how it all comes together. Yeah, I mean, it's like the analogy would be like, you want to write a book, but you haven't really learned the alphabet, the grammar, it's not there, you know, and then now you're wanting to write a book. You want to go right to the book and write some eloquent Shakespeare, but yet you haven't even, you don't know the fundamentals of the language and how to put together, piece together words. So you have to have a, a base from which to start, and then you can take that AI to wherever, wherever you want, and, that's, and it's, it's all coming. But you're not going to get there unless you have that base. You have to have something for the AI to be able to, you know, to to dig at, to be able to unearth, right? If it's all over the place, it's garbage in, garbage out. You can ask the most eloquent question. And AI could have the most eloquent algorithm to try to get that data, but the data is bad. You're not going to do, yep. <laughs> it's not going to mean much to you, right? And the people within the organization that know the data are going to be extremely valuable. Right, because they're going to be able to, to go through the details. They're going to be able to understand the information. They're going to be able to articulate how, what does this mean for the business and how is this going to change? Because we'll, later we'll get into this concept of write back and the ability to actually modify data now. But once again, if you not if you don't understand the makeup of that information, how do you apply that to the planning process? So let me uh, let me jump into a, a very hot topic now. I know that the, at least in the U.S., the government has extended the budget for the government, but it's always something that happens every year, extending and and going through the the difficult part of uh, the nature of the government. So, in your kind of in your expert opinion, do, you know, with contractors accounting for these unprecedented natures of the government and the government funding. How does this impact the financial planning of a business, knowing these are external factors that may have an impact? One more time, Mike. So the external factors and what the funding, how does it impact? Yeah, so like government funding, like how does that impact the business and how should they be, how should businesses and government contractors be thinking about the government funding? Oh, absolutely, yeah, I know. That we go through. Government funding, I mean, it's based on, like, I mean, you have to present and you have to have you know, good, uh, your provisional numbers, et cetera, right? And you have to have a solid way to track your financials by project, right? There, you're sometimes in jeopardy. If you cannot track the financials in a project and you can't tie out and how you're, uh, you know, whether on a, on a task basis, how you're cascading costs down to a project, et cetera, that is not, that is frowned upon, right? By DCA auditors, et cetera. So why it, it, it's, it's unfortunate, but a lot of people, like that's where the, in the government contractor spaces, there's a little bit of a, a scary factor, right? And that's why people start going straight to, you know, a, a systems like Delta, and they're willing to pay a lot of money for them because they know if they mess up on this brand new shiny contract that's gonna run them a five-year backlog, they don't wanna mess this up. They wanna make sure that the reporting on this stuff is pristine, right? And so there is a real threat. And if you don't, if you're doing the, the calculations in the back of the napkin and trying to get in, it's, there's a real threat that you're not going to be, you're, things are going to go wrong in that contract from a, from a contractual perspective. So government's going to be more and more sharpening the pencil, making sure that you're, you're, you know, spending taxpayer dollars wisely, right? And in order to do that, you have to have a system where you can actually go to sleep at night knowing full well that you're doing this correctly. Right, you're not wanting to have to submit your ICE schedules, et cetera, at the last moment, figuring out, oh no, I, I got some real problems here. And I've seen that. I honestly have seen that where there's been, you just couldn't even 
tie out some of the numbers and some of the allocations that were done. And, and okay, anecdotally, of course, and this was largely a result of, it all ties back to they had no idea how to bid a contract, right? And so what they were trying to do is they're trying to do the old, uh, you know, buy from Peter, sell the Paul kind of stuff, where they were trying to take some costs that were should be allocated to project X, and they're trying to allocate to project Y because they, they overbid that one. They, they accepted a higher rate on that one and a lower rate on that one. They're trying to juggle the numbers, okay? So never good, okay, never good. And so that, that, uh, that caused them a lot of stress. And so there was a lot of, uh, you know, people asking those questions, like what happened here, like, how come this doesn't tell? And so they don't fool around, you know, when you, when you get into government contracting, it's not, it's not like uh, you can't eyeball it. It's, it's pretty, uh, you know, black and white. And so make sure that's what a, a lot of people spend a lot of money making sure that these numbers are right. But the good news is that we definitely have the tools so that you don't have to worry about making them right or seeing how it is that you're going to plot, you know, to sail this ship. You have the numbers and they're going to be at your fingertips. You're going to be able to know what your rates are, what they're doing from month to month. And it's a uh, it's much better feeling when you know than even if you know and, and they're high, let's say. Much better feeling if you know and that you have a handle on why it's high and what you're going to do to make it high than not knowing at all. Right, ignorance is not bliss. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's what I'll say about that. It's like, yeah, be careful in how you do your accounting and your presentations to on the project uh, level because it could seriously jeopardize winning in future contracts. Yeah, I mean, even if I look at my personal life, I'd rather know five days before something happens versus on the day that it happens where I can't actually think about what I'm, how I'm going to solve that problem. So it's best to know up front or as soon as you possibly can instead of on the, on the day. 100%. Which is a, another great segue into, you know, taking this concept and all this uncertainty in the world, all these manual tasks that, that companies are going through and being able to leverage data for the best decision making that you can provide the organization. So kind of the first question that we typically get asked all the time when we're going through projects is why do why do contractors need access to real time information? What are the key benefits of having this data at their fingertips? Which obviously it seems obvious, right? But just curious from your perspective, you know, there are always you know, a lot of the government contractors that we've worked on together, they're very manual. They don't have this real time and they're, they're doing just fine, not, you know, scaling appropriately, but they're doing just fine. So giving them real time access, what is that true benefit for that? Well, you're basically um, buying artificial wisdom when you have the numbers at your fingertips. Right, so you have data, then you got you know your little pyramid information goes to knowledge, and knowledge. You're buying wisdom. The CEO will he'll know that something's wrong. He's like, no, nah, that can't be the rate. There's been a hundred times I've been walking into a CEO's office. I'm like, hey, listen. He's like, nah, it's not forty percent. Nah, that's not right. And sure enough, he's right. He's got the wisdom. Right? We don't know how he knows, but he's got this wisdom because he's been in the industry for like forty years. He knows exactly what's going on, right? He can't explain why he knows it's wrong, okay? But you shouldn't have to rely on one guy who's got the wisdom to run the entire ship. Now you got, you know, 40 projects, let's say. You got one guy with the wisdom to know that something's not up and completely above board on this project and we're kind of flying in the, in the, in the wrong direction, right? So what it does is when you have the numbers at your fingertips, everybody now has the same wisdom as Mr. CEO. They don't have to guess. Right. So it's like, OK, when they're having a discussion, it's like, yeah, our rates are kind of um, they're upticking. And uh, we got to make sure that we kind of got to that everybody's in agreement. You know why? Because the numbers are all there because the data says that is there. That's the numbers. And more importantly, it's disseminated to everybody that needs to know. No guesswork. Right now, the discussion could be between project manager and CEO is like, how, why am I getting burdened with the, uh, this rate? Right. Um, I got a bunch of people that don't even take medical care, but this, you know, this fringe has medical, even in my guy, and my guys don't even have that. So I'm getting burdened with more fringe than I should. Good discussion. Okay. That's what the discussion should be. Not what, uh, nah, this didn't look right. So 
that's where the discussion should happen. You should have the detail and, and the program manager should have those details to be able to have a, a discussion. This is actually a good point too for leverage from data. What we can also do is in that scenario, okay, this might be getting a little bit complex, but in that scenario where the program manager and a couple of them are arguing about they're getting burdened with too much fringe because they don't even use that tool uh, the way that other projects do. Okay, let's have this discussion and say, what would the rates look like if we had two fringe pools and we had two you know, kind of uh, ways to, to, to allocate? We can do that. That is kind of like the holy grail. I think Mike, you and I talked about that. That's kind of like the what if analysis, yeah. holy grail of trying to get the project, uh, trying to get indirect costs and project uh, cost reporting and really sharpen that pencil and being able to have people do what if analysis and say, listen, I know I've set up my structure this way. What if my structure was this way? Does it make more sense? Does it breed a better result uh, overall in my company? So that's a big advantage. When you're leveraging data, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do that would take a long time and a lot of, quite honestly, smart minds that will charge you a lot of money, okay? Because there are, there are only a few people that could probably do that type of stuff. And but you know we're giving that to whoever wants to try it. You know we, we let the let the application do the work. Let let the the smart little uh, CPU do the work, not some dude out there that was uh, you know really really good and spent years and years in government contract and counting and has to do this manually. So I'd rather go with uh, A rather than scenario B. Yeah, absolutely, completely agree with you. Yeah. And that's uh you know we're gonna actually go through you know taking all of this knowledge that we've gone through today and really focusing on the data driven information how do we take that and optimize resources within the government contracting space because it all comes down to labor hours and making sure that you're optimizing those labor hours that you're allocating the right resources to projects and you're looking at historical data to understand, well, how successful was I on a project that's very similar to a project that I'm about to win and learning from our mistakes. I think as humans, that's what we do really well is when we fail, as we all do, we learn from those failures. So we don't make the same mistake twice. And being able to leverage historical data is extremely important. So in your opinion, Master, what are some of the best practices that government contractors who track workforce productivity and project progress? What are those best practices and what should they be doing to optimize resourcing in projects? So it starts from the budgeting process, 100%. Okay, what we've seen a lot is, yeah, get Mike, uh, put him on this project, right? Without knowing the ramifications of the numbers. They look at Mike and they're like, okay, Mike's a very expensive resource. He comes to this project, starts working on it. And then the, after like two or three weeks of Mike just, Shoving in time, like whoa, what's going on? Like we're gonna, we're, if we at this burn rate, we're gonna be way uh, over budget on this, right? So it's just kind of like this management by feel that gets uh, people into problems, okay? And you know when we set up all, when we do our government contracting and we set up the, the system, it all starts with the direct labor. Every project gets their direct labor forecast. You have direct visibility, who's working, what their rates are, how many hours they're going to be working, how many, what the PTO did, et cetera, et cetera. You have a very concise way of looking at the project, where it's going to land, right? If things continue the way they are, we can even add a 2BD resource, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no guesswork, right? You have a, let's say 90 to 95% confidence interval, that this is the way that direct labor is going to pan out in this particular job. People might leave, and new resources might be needed, rates might fluctuate, et cetera. But when you're budgeting and forecasting, if you can come within 90, 95% of a prediction of the future, you've done some good work. The other thing that we'll say is we leverage the past performance on a, on a contract when we do the forecast. What does that mean? We'll look at your timesheet data, right? We don't even dip into cost point. We dip into the time entry system that Dell Tech uses, right? And we get your data from the time entry system because that's the most accurate depiction of how people are booking time to projects. Accountants sometimes, whether for the good or for the bad, they find, you know, they move stuff around, they cruel some stuff, this and that and the other thing. And sometimes it's not the most accurate ground level depiction of how people are spending their time on a project. But when you look at a timesheet, it doesn't get much more accurate than that. 
Okay. So we're using that as the base and saying, okay, Mike worked this many hours on this the last year, right? Are we going to expect him to work the same? What is his rate? We get that rate from the system as well. So if there's a new rate that he has, et cetera, we're baking that in. So it is a very tight way to forecast your labor. Okay. And then as people are putting in timesheets, we are looking at utilization using people's hardcore timesheets. So we're building reports that say, Mike spent, you know, 38 out of 40 hours this week working great, right? And then next month, Mike's on the beach, he's spending 12 hours out of four. What's going on with Mike, right? So we have that information, not two weeks, like what hap often happens in these reporting systems is that you have to wait for accounting to post, it hits the general ledger, two weeks out, you're getting stale data at that point. Program managers always complain that their project status reports like, why do I gotta wait two weeks to figure out what my labor is gonna, what people booked for the last two weeks? Because that's the way that traditionally you have to wait for payroll to come in, people to do stuff, the accountants have to do their thing, they post those numbers, and then they end up, the new PSR ends up with numbers because those time entries are being pulled from cost point, which they're not ready yet until accountant hits the button and posts all those things. We say, no, no, no. Okay, we're gonna get that information directly from time entry, so you have, your, your 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 rule is that you gotta have your time in time in before 10 a.m. the next morning. Okay, the maximum you're gonna be out is one day. That's much better way of looking at your what people are doing on a project than waiting two weeks, not knowing who's you know, and just going with the loose kind of uh, method of, of of managing the project. Then you got you and me competing for resources that we both like, right? Like, no, I need them. No, I need okay, whatever, right? So. Upfront, you forecast, you make sure that you have each uh, resources, you've already agreed to who's gonna be on what, you know your needs in the next year, there's some TBD stuff that you have to get. We all know that, right? And it's a very tight ship that you're now uh, sailing. So that's how you optimize your resources. You know what the hell they're gonna be doing before they start doing it. Otherwise, no. It's like, hey, yeah, you walking on the shop floor. What are you doing today? I have no idea, right? Something. I know I'm going to have to have my timesheets, right? So not, not a good way. But when you have it all, you know, done at the beginning, good way. Yeah. And, and two, two pieces that I take away from, from your answer really comes down to, like you said, forecasting and being able to pre help predict where you're going to go. But it all also resides on historical data. I mean, going back yeah. to, and I like to make a lot of analogies in, in, back into the consumer world. If you're going to buy a product, What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to review all the people historically that have already purchased that product and what those reviews are for that product. Now, if we take this and correlate it back to the government contracting space, you want to be able to track all of your resources. How well were they under budget, over budget on how many different projects? And you can use this historical data to help prepare for the next project and forecast for the next project going forward. Exactly. Exactly. So when you think about, you know, we, we talk about, um, you know, resource management, um, overextending team members, but still trying to hit project milestones and some of the challenges that government contractors face there. But ultimately, you know, we, we talk a lot about what are the, the key components of the planning process and the importance of building data models and getting, getting access to all the historical data. But ultimately, you know, how do you typically leverage technology and what type of technology is useful? To government contractors when getting to this point okay so there's different layers right and so we'll i'll start from the base so that we're all base finding it so obviously you have to have a system in place that can capture your accounting records by project by org by gl by date etc you have to have an accounting system that captures the necessary elements of your cost and your revenues so that you can analyze it at the project level right so that's why people buy uh cost and, and other you know, ERP systems specifically to deal with these things, okay? The second phase is those same systems, um, they have to deal with uh, a type of accounting is basically uh, indirect cost accounting, okay? We have indirect costs and you have to cascade down. So you have to have a base of this. If you don't, you're gonna be in trouble, right? And so the next phase is, once you have that, you have to be able to surface 
those numbers in a way that it makes it presentable. Okay, so that, okay, what, I thought these things captured, what do these numbers mean? And you have to have a nice way of looking at this so that you can determine what your, your, your contracts are doing, right? And how are they profitable, not profitable, et cetera. You have to have a way to manage that, okay? And at least look at what's already transpired on these contracts. Next step obviously is to build an expectation, right? Of what are we going to do on these contracts in the future and how we're gonna manage them. That part, a lot of time, is not done. It's a difficult yeah. thing. You have a you have the double under accounting system, okay? And, but then when it comes to budgeting and analysis, which I call the single entry accounting system, you kind of like leave that kind of on its own. You're just like, okay, if it happens, it happens. If it don't, it don't. Just think of your look around your neighborhood. How many people have you know their personal budgets on a spreadsheet and actually run through it? Some people do. Some people don't. The same way in business, much more dangerous in a, in a business situation because you have a lot of people. Um, you know, you can't just say, hey, listen, we're not going to go out to dinner um, this week because we're out of budget. And an organization is a lot more, it's a lot more difficult, right, to change that. So that's that's the other thing. Now, the other thing is to put it all together in a, in a very um, seamless way. These are all um, processes, and processes can either be manual or they could be automated to a certain degree, right? So again, I'm it all starts from gathering this data and having a model in place from which where you can gather everybody around the kitchen table. So you have your actual numbers, they're coming to the kitchen table, right? And then you have your fork and you have your massage numbers where you take your numbers and you're actually cascading them down to a project level. They come to the kitchen table. And then you have your forecast numbers presented in the same manner and they're coming to the uh, kitchen table in what's called like an our data market. And then from there, you can do some slick reporting, and then you can start, you know, really optimizing how your your organization is running from a financial perspective. It's no accident that you know when tight budgets, et cetera, they just are make your company run more efficiently. If you want to make more money, that's usually where you want to start, right? That's why you have all these like, uh, you know, PE firms can come in. I don't know if you ever worked anybody on the on the lines ever worked with like a private equity firms and stuff. I mean. It's all about budgets and hitting numbers. It's like going to the gym. You got a competition coming up. It's like, okay, I got to make it to this number by this date. I mean, I just got to get stronger. And they have like, you know, routines and say, okay, you got to add another five pounds this week. Another, then you got to up it. You got to do this. You got to do that. It's the same thing. It's no different. It's very much like life. You know, everything requires like a plan. And once you plan, you know, I don't want to sound too cliche, but yeah, you got to plan to succeed. Yeah. Which is which is great because you know as, as you know uh, and I know we're we're running out of time here. This has been a great session and I, I didn't want to spend uh, a lot of time at all on on the product itself. But just as a a quick recap, what we've done together is we've been able to create what is known as a rapid result pack. So for government contractors, they can now get access to a lot of this key information that we talked about: the foundation, the data model, the historical data, the connectivity to their source system. The budgeting and planning, the what-if simulation, all of this is pre-packaged into a wrapper result pack that covers all of these different topics that you're seeing on the screen right now independently and going into details of what is that reporting? What's my profit and loss? By, what's my actual data? What was my last year? How do, what's the comparison look like? Being able to do this in various roll-up structures. Also looking at workforce planning. Well, how many people are we planning for as, as part of this project? What is their 401k profit sharing? What's their annual salary? And tying all these costs into the mix and then being able to project this across different projects as well and the success of those projects. Getting into payroll tax planning, right? Another important element because it all comes back down to labor because that's the most expensive element of a project is the labor component of things. And you want to be able to make sure that you have every single element of the labor process built into your planning workflow getting into annual hours. So what are what type of PTO schedules do people have? Military leave, sick leave, right? All of these things need to, to play a role in that planning process to get to the, the, the proper budget. Labor hour planning. So now you're getting down to the individual labor hours. Are you over or under budget by project? And if you are, do we need to reallocate resources 
to make sure that we stay under budget for that specific project. And knowing this in real time, which goes back to the earlier question that was brought up, if you have this, you can proactively go and, and change something. But if you're at the end of the project and you find out later that, oh, I'm over budget, there's nothing you can do anymore, right? It's, it's already, you have to eat that cost versus trying to figure out ways that you can mitigate that going forward, at least break even at the bare minimum if you find that out. And then you have a pipeline review, right? So not only just mitigating or uh, managing, excuse me, the, the current projects that you're facing, but you have team members that are out there trying to find new projects to engage with. And being able to take the historical data and leverage that in the sales cycle is extremely important. So you know, back to your point earlier, that you're bidding for this project and you have confidence at whatever rate that you're going to bid that at. You're, you're going to be able to be profitable at the end of the day and not hope that you're going to be profitable. You'll have the confidence and the data to back that up in, in a system. So with that being said, um, Nasser, I know that it was, it was kind of uh, a long session today, but I wanted to focus more on, on asking you, in your opinion, being the expert in this space, what typically we've seen in the government contract arena. But ultimately leading back to the product itself and being able to give some individuals a standalone solution to solve a lot of these different challenges that people have and ultimately be able to work with us going forward and be able to help them solve these challenges. Because there's two things that are important with every project that we engage in, and you know this. It's about time to value. We want to make sure that we're reducing the amount of time to implement a solution and give you the most amount of value within that time frame and then ultimately provide the benefits and the total cost of ownership of a solution like this. You don't want to implement a monolithic legacy platform and you have to have 15 people managing the infrastructure. You want to be able to have you know, a fraction of a person managing the infrastructure and be able to get the data quickly. So all of that can be done with the FTERRAS platform and we're here to help. Any, any questions that anyone has after today's session, please feel free to contact us. Nasser and I are both available for you to have a 30 minute session with you as a health check to understand your business a little bit more and ultimately finding ways for us to help you. We just look forward to possibly working with you in the future. And uh, again, thank you very much for your time. And Nasser, of course, it's always a pleasure working with you and talking to you. So thank you so much for your expertise today. Uh, anytime, anytime, Mike. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, okay. everyone. Have a wonderful day.